we have, um, as a church, uh, continued to celebrate Good Friday, continued to celebrate the death of Christ, because the death of Christ is what makes all the difference. Without His death and resurrection, our faith is empty. The cross is what changed the entire structure and entire history of mankind. And without the cross, our faith is hollow. It makes no sense at all. Today, we use the cross as our earrings, as a piece of ornament, and we can even tattoo it on our body. But Jesus, let's remember, was carrying the cross on his back. It was hard. Being a God-man, as, as being a man, it was hard for him to carry that weight. And that's why somebody had to carry it for him. But then, the weight of the sin he took upon himself. And completely took upon himself. And that is why tonight, I want us to focus on what is this, what does this cross mean? What is the power of the cross? Because the power of the cross takes away the sin of the world. Not only the sin, Christ was able to conquer death. And without that, our faith has no meaning. It's important for us to bring this up constantly because this is what makes our faith strong and it makes the body of Christ one. I want us to look at our question this, this, this evening and our question is, what is this power uh, of the cross? What does it mean? So the first thing is that the power of the cross, it turns our, our defeat into victory. Whatever defeat that we may be having in our life, it turns it into victory. Jesus, you know, the, 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 the demonic world was thinking they have defeated Jesus on the cross. And that's what so many times we think, that we are living a life, defeated life, because so many times we think the cares of the world, the, the cares of our families, cares of the responsibilities, cares of our jobs, cares, uh, you know, people getting addicted to certain things, and we think we are fighting a losing battle. And in that losing battle... We might even give it up. We might give up everything. And that's why I want us to look at Luke chapter 24, verses 46 to 49. And this is what it says. And he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Jesus is on the cross. And as he is on the cross, Satan on the sidelines is watching. The demonic world is watching. The angels are watching. Humans are watching. His disciples literally thought he had lost it. The world thought he had lost it. Satan thinking, wow, I offered him like three times. I said, hey, bow down before me, turn this, uh, the, these stones into bread, uh, and uh, you worship me, and you can take the world for yourself. And he didn't do it. Now he's losing it. And the demonic realm is thinking, man, whenever he was going out and he was driving us out from people whom we had possessed, we were telling him, don't do that. It messes us up. He didn't listen to us, and even then he did it. Now look at him, where he's at. He's defeated. He's on the cross, defeated. The world looked at him, and the world is thinking, this guy, 
He was the one who was healing people. He was resurrecting people. And now he's lost it. Wow. He, he, the previous week he had just resurrected Lazarus. And now this, this man who is who's a thief and he's on the cross, on the left side of Jesus, he's saying, Hey, you did these miracles. You saved others. Now save yourself. He's also thinking he's lost it. He's defeated. Nobody was willing to wait for three days. It requires patience. So many of you are thinking you've lost life. You've lost everything in life. Things are killing me. That my finances are killing me, my family is killing me, my job is killing me. The drugs that I am on, it's killing me. I don't know where I'm going. You know where we have to go? We have to come to the cross. We have to come to Jesus. The power is only in the cross. That is why Jesus at the cross turned defeat into victory. But it was a matter of three days. They had to wait for three days. Are you willing to wait on God to do his work in your heart and in your life so that he turns your defeat into victory? God wants to do that. Give him an opportunity. You're not defeated. You may be knocked down. But you can still get up. Because when you get up, the victory lies in the hands of the Lord. It's his. Allow him to make you victorious in life. I'm going to look at the second thing as we see the second thing as to what happens, what, what, what the power of the cross is. The second thing is he turns the curse into a blessing. How many of us over here have been living under a curse? We were born under a curse. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, what did God do? He cursed the ground. And because of that, indirectly, Adam was cursed. We've been carrying that curse. But the curse can turn into a, into a time of a blessing. I want us to see this, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, and Galatians chapter 3, 13. It is the same thing, and it says, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. For our curse, somebody had to die. Somebody had to go on the cross. Somebody had to be hung on a tree to take that curse. And the only person who could do that would be Jesus. The only person would be the one who is a lamb without blemish. The one who is sinless. Nobody else could do it. And nobody else will be able to do it. The only person who was sinless the only person was a lamb without any blemish would be Jesus. He had to do it. But I want us to bring, bring you to something, something very powerful that I, I came across in Numbers. It's found in Numbers. I'm going to Numbers. Numbers chapter 22. Verse 12. If you've got your Bibles, let's turn to it. It's, you know what it says there? You must not put a curse on these people. He's talking about the Israelites. Because they are blessed. And then it says in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 2. In the end, God converted all their curses against the Israelites into blessings. Wow. Wow. He converted, you know, the conversion takes place at the cross. 
Conversion of the curse into a blessing cannot take place anywhere else except the cross. Because that curse that has been upon our lives and we have been carrying it. So many of us are carrying it in our DNA. Think about it. I'm, I'm just going to give you a, a, a time to think about a little bit. If you are an angry person, think about who was angry in your family, your forefathers. Look at your father, look at your mother, look at your grandparents. Who was angry? Passed it on to you. Promiscuous lifestyle? Think about it. Who was promiscuous in your life? Your mom, your dad, your grandparents? You've been carrying that curse. You've been using obscenities from your mouth. Who has been using obscenities in your life? Think about it. Your mom, your dad, your uncle, your aunt, your grandparents. You've been carrying that car curse and you don't even know that you're carrying that curse. You have to break that curse. You have to step into that place to break it. You have to be the curse breaker. And the only one who can help you to break that curse is Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us the person who hangs on the tree has taken the curse. If we believe in anything else, the curse will never go. The only way the curse will go and turn into a blessing is when we bring our curses that we have been carrying to the cross. Put it on the cross and allow God to bless you. Blessings flow out from God's hand. He wants to bless you. But if you want to carry the curse all your life, just like your forefathers have been carrying it, you still have the choice. But if you really want to break it, this is the time to break it. I know there are people on my team who have been carrying curses upon their lives. One of the kids, you know, there was some beer stuff flying outside and the, one of the kids went to pick it up and I said, hey, your kid is going to pick up that beer bottle. He says it runs in the family. Curses. Recognizing the curse. Think about it, what's going on in your life, in your family, in your family's life. The curses that have been building up in your life and you don't know what to do with it. Are you willing to step out and cancel that curse? Break that curse? Because you have to be that great curse breaker. Nobody else will break it for you. You have to step, proactively step out and break that curse. And say, Jesus, I come to you and I know that this is the curse that my family has been carrying. I want to, Lord God, just stop it here. This is a place, there's not going to be a place of pause. There's going to be a place of stop, period, it's done. And I bring it to Jesus, Jesus takes it. And when he takes it, it becomes a blessing. That same thing that you thought was a curse turns into a blessing. I'm going to read it again. Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Chapter 13, verse 2, it says, In the end, God converted all the curses. Not some curses, not few curses, but all the curses against the Israelites into what? Into a blessing. Guys, this is what God does. This is the God we know. We know a God who is all powerful, all knowing, all he, He's amazing. He does things that you and I cannot even imagine. Everything is possible in the name of Jesus. What is not possible with man, it is possible with God. You may be young or old, doesn't matter. But in your DNA, 
you're carrying a curse. Some of you are really angry people here. And your anger has not left you. You've tried. Some of you, you've been like drinking like crazy all your life. And you don't know how drinking is going to, how I am going to get rid of drinking. It's a curse upon you. It's a curse upon your family. Guys, you, you got tonight. God didn't just bring you here just for a walk in the park. He brought you here for a purpose. You are here because God brought your steps here. And he brought you for a time like this. So that your curse is broken. You have to take the step. I can't take the step for you. I can just help you. I can just help you navigate. But it's your deal. You have to take the step. The last thing I'm going to turn, what the, what the power of the cross does, the power of the cross turns death into life. How many of you are dying? Internally, you are dying. You're thinking, man, I'm at a place that I might just die anytime. I don't know what's going on with me. So many of you are not even saved and you think you are saved just because you were born in a Christian family or you were going to church. But you are dying. The only way your death can turn into life is through the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ. Nothing else can do that because through this is life. Death has passed away. It took three days. Sometimes we think, hey, Jesus died on the cross. What happened to him? Peter talks about it. Peter says he went to the deep in those three days to minister to the souls that had died during the flood. Wow. To save them. Tonight is that night. He's here. His presence is here. He desires you. He can turn. You may be heading to death. Some of you sitting here, you may be suffering of a certain disease. You may be suffering of cancer. Dealing with the impossible. You, you may be dealing with certain ailment in your life, which is like the end. Only God can save you, nobody else. I can't save you. The well can't save you. Elam cannot save you. Nobody can save you. Only God can save you. He can turn your death into life. The first Adam brought death for us. You and I are still under that first Adam. Till we accept Jesus Christ, who is the second Adam. He brought life. If we have not accepted the second Adam, we are still living in death. We are still living under the law. God wants to give you life. Would you allow him to give you life? Life abundant, life eternal. There's something powerful that God is doing tonight. I, I can see many of your hearts ripped open tonight. And God is working in your heart. He is touching your heart. Before we close, I'm going to share a story with you. Charles Colson, who I got to meet in 2006, he was part of the Watergate scandal. He was in prison, started the prison ministries in America. He wrote a book called 
kingdoms in conflict. He writes a story there about Poland, 1920s, just before the fall of communism. A law was passed that all crosses will be removed from all buildings, private or government, they will all be removed. The religious leaders got really mad. So they relaxed the law. And they said, okay, we won't remove the crosses from the schools, but rest everywhere, we will remove it. So here it goes. The administrator of a particular school, he is a zealous communist. So one day he removes all the crosses in the school. The next day the students come back to school. They tell their parents. The parents come with new crosses and they put them up in the school. This guy is like he's not budging. He goes in and removes those crosses again. The next day there is a sit-in. Two-thirds of the school of a 600 population shows up and there is a sit-in. Protest. The police is called in and they're all driven out from the school. And all these children and parents, they go to a nearby church and they are joined by 2,500 students from other schools protesting the same thing. People are weeping. The priest gets up and he preaches a message. this point I'll ask every one of you to stand up the presence of God is invading this place permeating your hearts all of them including the priest They had crosses over their heads. He preached a powerful message. And at the end of the message, this is what he said. Without a cross, there is going to be no Poland. With today's status quo and the political status quo that we have and the changes that are taking place radically, the changes that are taking swiftly, 
This is my call. There is going to be no America. And I'm saying it loud and clear for everyone to hear. Here and outside. There is going to be no America without a cross. Take it or leave it.